Hey guys, this is Austin, and I wanted to take a quick moment to update the episode before uh, it begins playing. Uh, we recorded this episode on Saturday morning, and around Saturday afternoon, uh, more information came to light about the Hillsong comments and the comments made by uh, the various leaders that sheds new light on the story in a way that makes the information we were working with for this episode outdated. So listening to this episode, please just keep in mind that there has been more information on this story. Brian Houston has put out a statement of his own, and there is also a, a transcript available uh, from the audio of that press conference about the fuller context of what he said. And uh, we didn't have that information or Brian's response when doing that episode. So um, we have put the links to both Brian's response and the transcript in the show notes for this episode. So if you go to anotherascendinglark.com, uh, the show notes post will be the first thing that you see when you come to the website. You'll be able to read uh, Mr. Houston's uh, response to the news articles and the transcripts themselves. So uh, please just keep that in mind when listening to this episode. The information we have is outdated. And we decided not to re-record the segment just because we said some things that we felt were true of a much bigger picture that were as uh, applicable to situations beyond Hillsong, beyond Hillsong United, uh, and just kind of revisiting some topics that we had revisited before. So that's why uh, I recorded this message instead of re-recording that segment. So uh, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Closing Track, the official podcast of anotherascendinglark.com where music and the Christian worldview collides and negative it didn't go in, just impacted on the surface. Maybe that wasn't a good idea to open that show up with that, because that could reflect really badly on uh, what we're actually trying to do here. They didn't actually go into the Christian worldview, they just kind of impacted on the surface. Well, that's pretty much what most Christian artists wind up doing anyway. <laughs> like the ones that say Jesus 50 times and that's the entire song. Or like Gabriel, and believe me, I mean, how much more impacting on the surface can you get when you have Jesus times four times 16. Yeah. I mean, that's about as impacted on the surface as you could possibly get. But have you actually, uh, did you actually see the uh, the concept album or the concept artwork for uh, the new Star Wars movie that they came out with? Yeah, um, I did some. I and... thought it was pretty interesting. I'm really excited to uh, to see these things you know, like fleshed out in real life, uh, the... especially Tatooine. I thought Tatooine was pretty cool. The one thing that made me excited is when they first got Peter Mayhew back, I was kind of wary i was like wait a minute chewbacca's dead in the book so they're really gonna contradict it that much and then i saw that it was a cyborg chewbacca and i'm like huh i was like what a maybe cyborg chewbacca this is a uh, this is interesting uh, <laughs> maybe they could just say that he actually did survive a moon falling on him you know because then, yeah that shouldn't kill anyone i mean if chewbacca died because a moon fell on him i mean that means chewbacca wasn't all that great to begin with I yeah mean, fair we, enough we have moons fall on us all the time and look at us we're still alive and chewbacca's a freaking wookie he should have yep. been just fine with that yeah but it'll be interesting um hopefully they won't contradict the already in place canon too much to the point that it's like horrible but We'll see. They haven't done anything yet, at least as far as, you know, revealing concept artwork and uh, just general plot details to uh, really get me nervous yet. Now, granted, they have a whole year to do something that's going to set me on edge, but uh, so far, I think J.J. Abrams has been uh, doing a pretty good job so far. I mean, yeah. I'm definitely, like, eagerly excited to see the next Star Wars movie, but I'm sure that my excitement pales in comparison to your excitement. I don't know. Like, mine's a mixture of excitement and terror because on the one hand i'm like okay jj abrams he's a fanboy he understands how badly people want to keep the canon and all that sort of stuff but on the other hand i'm like disney doesn't really care about that at all no disney's just going to do whatever brings in the dough for disney which i mean people say that but at the same time just like if you follow the canon those wishy-washy fans who really don't care that much i mean they're still going to go watch it the hardcore fans like me We'll be even more excited and even more likely to spend money on it if you actually follow the canon. But you will also be the ones to be the most like vocally critical if it goes bad. Yeah, exactly. So you are either the like make 
like like the the fan base that either makes it what it is or you're the fan base that kills whatever chances of being successful it might have yeah which hopefully they stick with the canon enough to where it winds up being good Yes, I agree. My name is Austin. I am the head honcho of another Ascending Lark. I'm the one who uh, does all of these things that I'm supposed to do. You should also be in charge of finding things for me to say for this spot, ways of humiliatingly introducing myself. I'm all sure right. you'll, have plenty, you'll have no problem finding things for that. Yeah, that does sound like fun. And I'm Brett, the other guy over here, and a massively unapologetic nerd who very much enjoys Star Wars. Okay, for a second there, I thought you were about to tie that back into My Little Pony, and I was about to throw my coffee cup at you. See, now you're the first one to mention My Little Pony on this show. Dang it! That was your plan all along, wasn't it? Well, no, but it worked out just fine. Urgh. I can't believe I fell for that. I can't believe I fell for that. I didn't even set you up for anything. How could you fall for something you didn't set up? I blame my cold. <laughs> I was the one who woke up with a cold this morning. You have your remnants of your cold from last week but i was the one who woke up and i'm just like oh my head is like exploding but i feel well enough to do a show today because i don't want to do it again on monday night yeah good uh if you want to contact us you can find us on facebook at another ascending lark you can follow our twitter handle at aal blog or you can send us an email at another ascending lark at gmail.com or of course you can check out another ascending lark.com where we post all of these show notes for the show. Uh, we had an article on the Dove Awards, uh, Beauty in the Christian Worldview, uh, published there uh, last week, and we're starting to rev up the publishing cycle again after being on hiatus for, well, being officially on hiatus for about nine months, but being on a writing hiatus for about ten months. Uh, I got to get the, the writing muscles in me flexing again. I'm like that, you know, the kid in the gym at, you know, the start of every New Year's who is like, yeah, I'm going to work out, I'm going to get in shape, and they do, you know, a real light workout, and it's like, oh, I can't do this anymore. That was how I was after the article, yes, after last week's article, I was like, man, nice. I've lost my, uh, I've lost my writing chops. Uh, we got a, a quite the show planned for you, a lot of news, a couple of albums to cover, and then uh, another uh, controversial subject, because um, if you know either Brett or I, uh, we are not ones to shy away from controversy. Um, but first, we have a couple of news things to get into. Um, first and foremost, because we we need to have like a a goal of seeing how many episodes we can squeeze something about you two in. That does sound like an interesting goal. We should try it because it seems like every episode now, ever since uh, the Lecrae episode where uh, we re reviewed the U two album. Uh, we have found a way to squeeze you two into it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, the biggest, the, the biggest U two bomb this week was that uh, they they are apologizing for their release stunt, uh, which I don't I don't know I don't understand why pe I still don't understand why people are so upset about this. I mean, I think this is a first world like I think this is like in the hallmark of first world problems that people would complain about getting a free album from a great band. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they hacked their accounts and stole their systems. And I mean, and all they did was just download an album. If you don't want it, don't just listen do, to just it. Just delete it. Just take it off your phone. I will grant. Okay, I will grant that the surprise factor of it because was was maybe a little bit uh, unplanned well because initially people were thinking like oh my gosh you know my uh, account got hacked and people are buying an album or you know using my card to buy stuff that I didn't buy so I can understand that maybe the shock value of it uh, maybe could have been tampered down a little bit but still people are uh, are still up in flames I guess that you two had the audacity to give them a free album oh my gosh yeah I mean if anything Bono does need to apologize for giving a free album. He needs to apologize for the album artwork. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I saw the album artwork for Songs of Innocence, and um, it really did bother me. Like, I saw it, and I was like, I don't know what they're going at here, but I do not like this. Yeah, it was kind of creepy. Uh, very creepy. Um, and I'm not going to describe it, just because I don't know how to describe it in a way that would not make me feel uncomfortable. Um, Basically an older, shirtless man caressing the chest of a younger shirtless man okay that's 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 actually a pretty accurate way to put it um i don't know what they're going for with it but uh i was definitely a little bit uncomfortable about it 
Uh, but there was a um, an interview on the uh, the band's Facebook page, and Bono was uh, asked a question by a fan, and uh, the fan asked, "Can you please never release an album on iTunes that automatically downloads to people's playlists ever again? It's really rude." And my first response was, "No, sir. Your question was really rude. Like, dude. Like, are you serious? That is." You're the rude one here. And then Bono, to his credit, being the, the class act that he has, uh, apologized. Oops, I'm sorry to hear that. I had this beautiful idea. I might have gotten carried away with We might have gotten carried away with ourselves. Artists are prone to that thing. A drop of megalomania, a touch of generosity, a dash of self-promotion, and the deep fear that these songs that we pour our lives into over the past few years might not be heard. There's a lot of noise out there. I guess we just got a little noisy ourselves to get through it. Beautiful, beautiful response. He could have said all sorts of things about how, oh, people are so selfish and people are uh, making a big deal out of this. But no, he, like, apologized and probably acknowledged that, hey, we could have done this differently. I don't like, I didn't like the way that they necessarily dropped the album because I thought it could have been done a lot better. But the fact that he still apologized for it, I don't think he had to apologize. Yeah, but I mean, if anything, maybe they could have made that announcement that they were giving the album away for free and then a week later maybe even a few days later download it so that way the internet has had enough time to sort of get excited about it and people would be prepared for it and then when they see the album they wouldn't think oh someone hacked my account and bought this album without me knowing yeah the, the good thing is is that uh you know lesson learned i mean we we now know what happens when you try to do this so no other band will ever do this i mean i don't care who you are no other band is ever going to try to do this again so it was an experiment and the experiment worked to a certain degree i mean it down it had you know 81 million downloads but uh, it also generated a lot of backlash that comes from you know experimenting with something so Still, um, kudos, kudos to the band for uh, for taking this, taking the criticism of this pretty dang well. Uh, Twitter. So, Brett, uh, why do you not have a Twitter? Because basically, it's just a watered down Facebook. No, that no, it is not a watered down Facebook. Okay, it's literally just status posting. It's status posting, yes, but it's also like an an RSS aggregate. I mean, people use it in place of RSS feeds to get news stories, to get updates on various things, and to uh, kind of organize those in such a way where they can get them all at once. But I can easily do that on Facebook. Nah, Facebook's a little bit more cumbersome to use as an RSS feed, though, because Facebook's algorithm is ridiculous. It is so stupid. It's so... Do you yeah. remember Do you remember the days... And this sounds so terrible, but do you remember the days where uh, you had to go in and change... Like every time you visited Facebook from, uh, oh gosh, uh, top stories and most recent. Yeah, I remember that. Because that, you know, selfie that some random girl took, you know, three weeks ago that had, you know, 100,000 likes was at the top of your feed every time. And you're like, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, uh, Facebook definitely has gotten a bit too complicated. I think they really need to sort of go back to the roots. But at the same time, like, I get you know, all the major news stories you'd get on Twitter, on Facebook anyway, so I just feel no need to get a Twitter. I have been a Twitter fan for quite a while. Honestly, I would rather give up Facebook and just have Twitter just because Twitter is a little bit more easier to, to use on, on my end. But uh, Twitter, and I don't know why they're now just now doing this, it seems like this would have been done a long time ago, uh, you can now... Uh, well, there's this now uh, thing going to be called... Uh, there's going to be audio streaming within the Twitter app. Uh, there's debuting a something called an audio card which will be powered through uh, third-party streaming services and you'll be able to listen to audio within the uh, the Twitter apps for iOS and Android uh, they're partnering with SoundCloud which I guess this means that we kind of have to go to SoundCloud now I was kind of trying to fight off the whatever to go to SoundCloud but I mean that would be a really really cool thing for us to do if we could do st stuff on SoundCloud and you will be if a tweet includes a link from SoundCloud. The audio from that clip will be embedded in the tweet, and you can just listen to it within the tweet. Um, there's only a select handful of users that are getting that are getting access to this at the moment, uh, namely the White House, because you know everybody wants to listen to White House audio when they're surfing Twitter. I know I don't. I'm pretty sure even most people that actually care about political news and stuff 
wouldn't want to listen to literally everything the White House says. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, unless you're like a journalist and your job, you know, kind of depends on it. I wouldn't want to do that. Dead Mouse is currently getting to use that. Okay, no, no complaints there. And then a, a program from NPR is also getting to use that at the moment. Uh, they're going to be rolling out uh, this to other users here at a later later date. But yeah, it's something that I'm kind of surprised that a you that a Twitter is just now getting on board with, and I think this will be a really, uh, really good way to um, to integrate uh, the bite sized Twitter aspect of it into. Um, Oh, we just got a message on my phone. We should we should mention our friend Rachel since she just messaged us in the middle of the show. Uh, sure. What about Rachel? Hi, Rachel. Uh, yeah, we'll see you in two weeks when we go see our wonderful friends in Oklahoma. Crap, I have to edit that out. When we see our wonderful uh, church camp staff friends in Oklahoma. Why can't we say the P word? Because we don't want the opinions uh, that are expressed on this show to reflect on the camp in any way, shape, or form because... You and I both know that we say things. What do you <laughs> we mean? We say things. We don't say anything that could possibly reflect badly no, on anything. No, we don't say anything that we can that could possibly reflect bad on the camp. No, whatsoever. None whatsoever. We are totally in lockstep with the values of the camp. Absolutely. Um, no, we are, but we're not. Uh, so yeah, we'll see our. We'll see you in a few weeks, Rachel. Thanks for the message. I guess that counts as like someone like calling into the show. Or something? Yeah, possibly. Okay, so sweet. Rachel has the honor of being the first person ever to call into the show. And she also has the honor of being a caller for Albert Muller's The Briefing. Yes, which I'm still really jealous of. I'm like, oh man, that's so cool. Uh, Albert Muller is such a beast. How do we get here? Because Rachel messaged you. <laughs> because Rachel messaged us. Um, one more news article uh, before uh, we get into album reviews, and this is a real tragic one. Um, Jack White's keyboardist, uh, Isaiah Ike Owens, uh, was found dead in Mexico during the tour for Jack White's new album. Uh, he is, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah Owens was an outstanding, outstanding keyboardist, out, a great live presence. He knew how to, uh, put a lot of emotion and stage presence into whatever he was playing. And he was unbelievably talented as is. Uh, but Jack White has, um, has decided to cancel the rest of the tour in Mexico, uh, in light of his death. Uh, the, uh, rep, one of his representatives said that uh, he died of a heart attack, which uh, that's that's pretty tragic because he wasn't you know he wasn't too terribly old of a guy, um, but he also played for uh, he had also had a stint with the Mars Volta a while ago, uh, and he played on uh, Deleuze and the Contorium and then Francis the Mute, which I have Francis the Mute and it's an outstanding album. It's an extremely difficult and complicated album to listen to, and uh, yeah, uh, this is this is pretty sad. Anytime there a talented act dies. Uh, well, even death in general, but especially, when, I guess, when it comes to someone who's got a lot of talent and who's a real good musician, um, that's really hard. So uh, our prayers go out to uh, Owen's family and anyone who knew him and anyone who was uh, connected with him in this in this time is this real, real tragic time. Um, okay, so yeah, that's it for news. Uh, Brett, let's get into uh, into some album reviews. Uh, All right. This is my favorite, well, one of my favorite times of the show, just because uh, we get to uh, say whatever we want about albums and know that uh, if we were to get any criticism for the things we say, it will come at a later point, um, especially considering that we review a lot of the uh, Christian albums, although we're actually only reviewing one Christian album this week. Hmm, interesting. I, I, think that's a, I think it's a first. Possibly, yeah. I think that's actually a first. Um, huh, cool. Okay, so uh, I am... Taking on uh, Sanctus Reels' The Dream, which I mentioned in the last episode that I uh, that I think very, very highly of Sanctus Real, uh, especially their older material, you know, anything up to We Need Each Other, which We Need Each Other is, in my opinion, their, their pinnacle point. And uh, I have been uh, very, very disappointed in their past couple albums, and I was hoping that maybe this would, uh, this, this album would redo or kind of go back in that other direction, and uh, it's not. Uh, it's definitely a step up from Run, the the prior album. Uh, definitely a step up in that regard, but overall, it's uh, it's official. Sanctus Real has become a radio-primed pop band. Instead of being this alt-punk, grunge rock e band that they were starting out yeah you have uh you know the opening at the dream which has a real nice youtube vibe to it there's a real nice youtube vibe 
uh, throughout quite a bit of songs. Uh, you have um, all sorts of songs that are a little bit more descriptive and a little bit more, uh, not quite as simple, I guess, as some of the title, as some of the songs on Run, but are still a little bit, I guess, simplistic. Uh, Head in the Fight is a radio single that they've been playing for some time now, and it's got a real, uh, well, not only not only Head in the Fight, but uh, several of the other songs, they've got real, like, <sighs> Brett, help me out here. Uh, the choruses are all, like, sentences of things to do. What would you call that? I'm really not sure, actually. Yeah, uh, they're, they're very, um, bam, do this, bam, do that, just bam, do that, because bam, do that. Uh, uh maybe, I mean, it's not really English really, but it kind of sounds legalistic almost to me. I don't think they're meaning it legalistically. I could, I don't think they're doing it legalistically, uh, but it's very simple all throughout the whole entire album. Towards the end, you have one word, one word at a time and on fire, which kind of goes back to the old Sanctus Real vibe, um, but it's too polished to uh, really count, I guess, because Old Sanctus Real did not have the polished vibe that they have now. Uh, Bend Not Break and uh, Ride It Out were two of the, I guess, better songs on the album, although I am still uh, strongly opposed to any any band who tries to paint the Christian life as an example where we will bend but we don't break, because that's... No, we, we are, there are times where we are completely shattered and broken, far beyond just bending. For sure, definitely. I, I mean, look at Job. I mean, I, I don't think you can read some of the, the, present mi- the, the present mindset of certain Christian songs where, yeah, you know, God's going to let you bend, but you're not going to break, uh, and, and apply that to Job. I mean, you, you can't. That's impossible. Job but, was absolutely destroyed. But God knows the plans he has for us, plans not for your destruction, but to prosper us. Man, we're pushing all the buttons on this episode so far. Yeah. But I will say that even though um, I'm disappointed with the direction that Sanctus Real is taking, this album is definitely a step up from Run. It's definitely a lot more musically uh, varied than run it's got a little bit of that feel you know the songs blending together a little bit but not as much as run and there are some instances where they do uh they do whip out some um synthesizers in a way that they haven't really done before so really the title the the title of the album being the dream there is a little bit of a dream pop vibe to this album in certain places which i mean i don't necessarily care for dream pop but i don't think that sanctus real uh kind of I think they did it okay. Uh, they're, they're just getting their feet wet in the whole dream pop thing. But um, no, overall, um, I, I am done with Sanctus Real. I, I don't want to say that because of the, uh, the fond memories I have of their earlier stuff and uh, the impact that they've had on my life. But from a musical standpoint, they have really uh, three albums in a row now. They've settled into the rut of uh, pandering to the radio with a very accessible, very safe, um, very simplistic kind of pop vibe. And while they're starting to get a little better at it, I don't like the fact they've taken that direction at all. So, Brett, what should I give this album? What should I put in it? What number should I put on this? 11. What? I don't know. I haven't heard it. I'm going to put this at, uh, I'm going to put this at a five because, um, it, I think I gave Run a four. And this is definitely a step up from Run, but it's not. I mean, it, it, I'm yeah, I'm just gonna give it a five and call it that. Uh, Brett, what'd you listen to this week? This week I listened to OK Go's newest album, Hungry Ghosts. Ooh, I like OK Go. Yeah, OK Go is awesome. Most of you probably know OK Go from one of their first music videos being the famous treadmill music video. Yes, which is still so much fun to watch. It is awesome. That was that was such a great music video. However, the second track on this album, The Writings on the Wall, has what is probably the best music video I've ever seen. That is, I think that really does transcend the idea of a music video because it breaks, it is so far out there in terms of how imaginative and how creative it is that I, in some ways, calling it a music video feels a little dirty just because, you know, the standard go, you know, the standard rate for music videos is anything but what they did. Yeah, it's basically like three minutes, 33 seconds of incredible optical illusions. Yeah, and it's it's excellently done. I mean, I remember watching it the first time and just being totally blown away by uh, by all the things that they do. And the tech guy in me, the video guy in me, was like, oh, I see how they did that. That's awesome. Like, 
oh my gosh, I didn't even know you could do that. That's so cool. I mean, when I watched it all the way through for the first time, I just couldn't even. I mean, I'm just sitting there in utter amazement that anyone could pull something like this off. Yeah, uh, their 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 music videos are awesome. But anyway, how's the how's the rest of the album? Does the does the uh, rest of the album hold up as well as their music videos do? Yeah, the rest of the album is pretty solid. They didn't ha- I mean, they didn't have really, really very many high points, but there weren't any low points either. Um, probably another one of my favorites besides Writings on the Wall was um, Bright as Your Eyes. That one was pretty good. And the one after that, I Won't Let You Down. I mean, that one got kind of repetitive in the chorus, but I still really liked it. I mean, the repetitiveness did sort of work with the rest of the song. And the final track, Lullaby, the only real slow song of the album, I thought that was really good. Okay. Uh, what would you pan as a, what would, or what would you put them at being, uh, what genre would you put this album as being? I almost want to say electronic, but... Electronic rock, maybe? Yeah, electronic rock, possibly. I mean, it's really difficult to put down a genre for OK Go. Yeah, because you watch their music videos and, you know, OK, that's their one song, and that one song might have, you know, a particular vibe to it, but the rest of the album, you know... Who knows what they're going to do for the rest of the album, so... I mean, you listen to some of their first singles, and they sound nothing like they do now. Yeah, they they definitely have come a long way, especially with their music videos. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, Okay, so what would you put a number on this? I'd probably put it in 8.5. Okay. I mean, it was a really good album. I mean, it's not like masterpiece level, but it's definitely worth a listen. I'll probably listen to it some more at a later date, but yeah, I mean, good album, definitely listen to it. I mean, if you're already an OK Go fan, you've probably listened to it by now. If you're not, shame on you, listen to it. Yeah, uh, it's definitely great. Um, I didn't mention this on, uh, I guess I'll go into my last album. Uh, I didn't mention this on uh, the last episode, uh, that Scar Symmetry's new album was coming out this week. And when I saw that it came out, I was like, wow, I'm stupid. I forgot about the fact that Scar Symmetry had an album coming out. Uh, Scar Symmetry is uh, one of the powerhouses of melodic death metal and uh, melodic... Uh, progressive metal and uh, they have released the first album in a trilogy which if you i mean how familiar are you with scar symmetry are you have you listened to much of them i haven't listened to them ever okay uh scar symmetry's like lyrical bent i guess has always been a uh, kind of dark sci-fi stuff yeah all of their albums really have a, a lyrical bent towards uh kind of sci-fi, dark sci-fi, and other related dark sci-fi subjects. And this album, uh, kicking off the first, uh, kicking off a trilogy, um, I'll just read it to you what it's about. Uh, The first phase of the trilogy is centered around the rise of Artelex, artificial intelligence, or artificial intellects, with mental uh, capacities far above human levels of thought. And by the year 2030, one of the biggest industries will be artificial brains used to control Artelex, that will be genuinely intelligent and useful. Pretty dang sci-fi. Sounds a lot like iRobot. Yeah, uh, it does sound a lot like iRobot. Uh, It goes on to say that the lyrical content focuses on the divide between those who embrace the new technology and those who oppose it due to the social issues caused by the rise of artificial intelligence and the emergence of transhumanists who add artificial technology to their own bodies. And that sounds like Deus Ex. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily the most original plot ever, but when you're doing a trilogy on this as a melodic death metal band... Yeah, and it's kind of hard nowadays to have a 100% purely original idea anyways, because so much has already been done. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, oh, definitely. Uh, But no, this album, I had kind of given up on Scar Symmetry because uh, they had their first three albums with uh, Christian whose last name I cannot pronounce. Um, And he was, you know, kind of the name behind Scar Symmetry that really helped them kind of, that really helped them rise up in popularity because of his uh, vocal prowess. And uh, he left the band, or he got fired from the band. Uh, And then they brought on two other vocalists, one to do clean vocals and one to do the growls because uh, Christian was such the powerhouse that he did both and did them both amazingly well that uh, they had to bring in two guys to replace him. And really what they do, uh, they've been doing since then, hasn't been bad, but it has, uh, I don't think they've yet to really kind of realize their new sound um, apart from the, the Christian era of Scar Symmetry. But this album uh, definitely, definitely blew me away. Uh, it's not a long album, 
I mean, it's not a full length album in that it's only got like eight tracks on it, uh, but it's got uh, two or three songs that are lengthier than, well, lengthier than usual Scar Symmetry songs. Uh, Neo Human is at eight, uh, is about eight and a half minutes long, and then the closing track, Techno. Co- uh, I can't pronounce it. Techno. <laughs> Hold on. Brett, English major, help. English major, come to my rescue. Technopolis, Cybergeddon. Yeah, there we go. The The first word in that is like, how in the world do I pronounce sorry. that? Technocalyptic, sorry. Technocalyptic there there we go. Technocalyptic, Cybergeddon. Um, yeah, I mean, you get the whole, you know, dark sci-fi thing. I mean, that's pretty dang, like, sci-fi there. Um, very strong songwriting throughout. They... I mean, Scar Symmetry has always had a progressive vibe to it, and that progressive element of it on on this album is definitely strong, especially on the longer songs where they'll uh, they'll shift through quite a few number of movements, and they'll uh, they'll make use of their modes of modes pretty well to give all sorts of real nice um, real nice changes to the sound. Limits to Infinity is the single that they've been playing for some time now, and it's got a really uh, catchy kind of death metal pop vibe to it without being a pop song. Uh, it's very very accessible would probably do really well on a uh, on metal radio and uh the chorus of it is kind of synthy and uh, like a oh 80s synth pop sort of vibe when they when they get to the cling chorus, chorus part of it it's a lot of fun uh children of the integrated circuit is an outstanding instrumental outstanding instrumentation outstanding arrangement only two and a half ish minutes long beautiful to listen to um, overall, this album was a phenomenal release. It's just as hard as Scar Symmetry ever is. The uh, the melodic elements are just as strong as it's ever been, but they're tapping into something that I don't really think has been there for the past couple of albums, and so I'm really excited to see what the what the rest of this trilogy holds. Another uh, another thing I'll give them a lot of credit for is uh, anytime you have like a multi part album, uh, there's the usual tendency of like the first album being incomplete just because, you know, it's part one of, you know, part, you know, a two-part or a three-part album or whatever. Uh, this album does not have that. Uh, when the closing track, which I can, still can't pronounce, ends, uh, it feels like it is ending. It, it feels like it's ending an album. It doesn't feel like it's ending, you know, in the middle of a larger work. So I give them a lot of credit for that. This album to- by itself is completely listenable from beginning to end, and it doesn't leave you uh, hanging at the end, even though you know that there's more to come. So I am going to peg this at a, uh, I'm going to peg this at a nine. Yeah, it, it's a great release. Uh, I don't think it'll be my favorite Scar Symmetry release that still belongs to Holographic Universe. Uh, uh, the Singularity Phase 1 Neo-Humanity. Uh, if you have checked out on Scar Symmetry, you're going to want to check back into this. If you're a death metal fan or a progressive metal fan, um, you probably are already listening to it right now, even as uh, we record this episode, because most of you are that dedicated that you listen to you know metal albums non-stop i'm not but oh well uh brett what do we got coming out next week next week we have ben howard's i forgot where we were we have slipknot's 0.5 the gray chapter which, which i call have, dibs on you can have that i don't want it and we also have susan boyle's hope which I don't. I, I felt I would just throw that in there just for fun. Um, if you, if you have forgotten who Susan Boyle is, she is the uh, the woman who uh, showed up on American Idol out of nowhere and like blew. Yeah, that's her. No, it was on um, Britain's Got Talent. Britain's Got Talent. You're right. I was just thinking because it had a uh, Simon Cowell. Yeah. It, and I no, you're right. Thanks for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Britain's Got Talent and like blows everybody away like this voice this angelic voice comes out of her mouth and is uh is wonderful but uh not necessarily too much coming out this next week that i was real excited for i'll probably listen to ben howard's album just because i've i don't had a passing fan interest into into ben howard but um no uh not really much coming out next week that i think i uh i'm too excited for so i might cover a couple of rewind albums next week. I was going to do a rewind review of uh, John Mark McMillan's album, but in light of the main course, I thought, nah, we can do that. Uh, we can probably do that next week. I think yeah. next week I'm going to cover John Mark McMillan's album finally. Uh, that's not the name of the album, but it, I'm finally covering John Mark McMillan's album. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's get into the main course. Um, so, earlier in the week, no, later in the week. It happened yesterday. Uh, later in the week, 
uh, as in yesterday, uh, some articles began circulating on the internet. Uh, one particular article that I've got pulled up right now is uh, Hillsong's Brian Houston says church won't take public position on LGBT issues. And the article went on to report um, that at one of their uh, one of their conferences, somebody asked them a question to clarify the church's position on same-sex marriage, and the uh, the the representatives of the church that were there, uh, Brian Houston of you know who's in charge of the whole Hillsong enterprise, and then uh, Carl Lentz, the pastor of the New York location, gave some comments that were um, either wishy-washy or uh, a non-answer but an answer. So this is uh, beginning to make the rounds in there, and uh, what caught my eye is the fact that it's Hillsong. And if you are a listener of Christian music, air quote, or if you uh, attend a church, uh, you undoubtedly know a few Hillsong songs. Um, unfortunately, God dang it, and now I've got Hillsong playing in my head. Brett, help me get it out. Help me get it out. I don't want Hillsong playing in my head right now. Think about the My Little Pony theme. Done. So this, with this news, the, the questions are going to be asked, okay, well, how does this affect uh, the Hillsong bands? We're not going to go into uh, what Brian Houston and what the other representatives said and, you know, all the other aspects of that because uh, there are several articles that are doing that really well. Uh, the one that uh, we're getting most of our information from is from Jonathan Merritt's website, and then there is an outstanding uh, article from First Things that breaks down the implications of these statements pretty well. What we're going to focus uh, pretty dang hard on how this will impact the Hillsong bands, because uh, I think this, as this continues to make make its rounds around the internet and people see it, that um, there could be a real uh, a real difficult backlash on the Hillsong bands. It goes without saying, first of all, that Hillsong is huge as a massive enterprise. Like the church's official stance on the subject because there are so many people in it, like it may not necessarily be shared by everyone in the church. Well, even like in smaller churches too. I mean, I mean, we've both attended small churches growing up and you know, the principle still holds true that I don't agree with everything my dad says. And my dad is, you know, pastor of a large church. I don't agree with all the stances his church takes. Um, so if it's true of our small, you know, how big was your church? I mean, there might've been like 60 ish people. Okay. So Mine's, my dad's church is slightly bigger than yours. It's about 100, uh, or it has been about 100 as of late. So uh, in, in, a small, in small town Baptist churches, um, the principle still holds true that, you know, we don't agree with everything that our particular churches stand on. And so with the broader Hillsong Enterprise, that is especially true. Um, and the same thing kind of uh, with, uh, you know, like Mars Hill. Uh, not everybody agreed with... Uh, you know, with Driscoll on the way he would do things. And I'm pretty sure that there are members in Joel Osteen's church who think that he's a heretic. I don't know. Just a like a secret, secret agent theologian, like sneaking into Joel Osteen's church and like trying to sabotage Joel Osteen's theology. That would be pretty cool, but I don't know. I seriously doubt that. <laughs> I, I doubt it too. Um, but the reason why we want to focus mainly on the, uh, the, worship or the, the band aspect of this i mean you even raised this question earlier this morning as i was preparing the uh, as i was preparing the set for the day uh you know what does the what do the hillsong bands really necessarily have to do with this decision but um joel houston who is the uh, the lead singer of hillsong united has been the co-pastor of the new york campus of hillside since 2010 and he's also the son of brian houston and he's also the creative director of hillsong church as a whole so uh the lead singer and kind of the head man of not only Hillsong United and uh, the rest of the Hillsong Enterprise is a strongly connected, like, is a co-pastor of one of the guys who said some stuff and is the son of the head guy of Hillsong. So uh, he is connected, the Hillsong United is connected to these statements um, by virtue of the fact that their lead singer and their front man is uh, so closely related to these decisions. Um I don't think, I'm just going to go get off the bat and state that I don't think the band is going to get involved in this. Um, I doubt the band will have to get involved in this, but. I mean, musically at least, I don't think anything's going to change because as it is, there really aren't any worship songs out there that can address the issues of homosexuality. And I mean, they never have, I doubt they ever will, but as bands themselves, I mean, they might 
comment on things, sort of. See, like the whole Gungor thing. Well, the Gungor thing was. I think the Gungor thing was. In in hindsight, I think most of the Gungor problem had more to do with the fact that his handling on social media was so more than it was like the theological beliefs himself. Like the, the way he went about handling it on Facebook and Twitter, I think caused more problems than his actual beliefs did. But uh, no, I doubt the band is actually gonna like publicly comment on it. I don't think the band is gonna want that because uh, that would my that would affect you know maybe some places or churches where they could possibly you know have a presence at or attend but at least that's just what my thoughts are i could be i could be wrong on that but nevertheless when you think of hillsong united i mean you you think of hillsong like like that connection is there so regardless of whether or not the band like even gets like involved in this or not the fact that they're you know the main band out of the church and the fact that they have the same name and the fact that their lead singer is a uh, is related to uh, the people who uh, you know at the heart of the at the heart of this news story. This will affect them in some way. Uh, hopefully, hopefully not very much because I don't want to see them have to be uh, dragged up in something like this because this would uh, this would be a bit of a interesting interesting struggle for the band if that had to happen. But uh, they're probably going to have to wade through some murky waters in light of the in light of these statements, depending on a. Uh, I don't know, depending on what they do about it. Did you know that uh, they actually recently came out with a song on the Apostles' Creed? I actually did not. Yeah, they actually recently did a song on the Apostles' Creed, which they Hillsong United, as a band, has been getting better as of late. Uh, as of late, they have been releasing uh, a couple of albums that musically have been have been decent and that they've been pushing themselves to make more creative music. I actually used... Uh, I think it was Zion. Um, I think that was the name of the album for uh, Beach the Beach Reach playlist. Um, I actually put that album into the Beach Reach playlist because it was a good album, uh, which normally I wouldn't do that because I'm like, no, like Hillsong United, no. Yeah. But that album was good. And then they come out with this song on the Apostles' Creed, which, hey, Reformed guys, what what you waiting on? Like. What, what, what are you waiting on? Why did Hillsong United beat you to the punch? Come on. But no, so I'm hoping that Hillsong United won't have to uh, get drawn into this fight a little too much. But I think as the story goes around, we might have to revisit the question, do we still sing the Hillsong songs in light of the fact that their church is taking uh, such a uh, such a non-stance on... Uh, on the the same-sex marriage debate. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Houston made it a non-issue, but the way Carl Lenz put it, I mean, it sounds like he's very much in support of oh, yeah. homosexuality. Oh, oh, yeah. Carl Lentz, uh, definitely. Uh, Carl Lentz is the pastor of the New York City campus, which Joel Houston is a co-pastor of. Uh, definitely was a little bit more onto the point than Brian Houston was. Uh, but do we... Uh, I think the question might be asked is, do we still sing Hillsong songs? We visited this question... Well, was that the first episode or was that the demo episode? That was the first episode. Yeah, because we, we covered that again in the, in the next episode about uh, do we still sing uh, Vicky Beeshing songs? Because Vicky Beeshing, uh, for those of you who didn't know, was a worship songwriter who came out as being uh, as being a lesbian. And uh, as you know, the article went around, people were raising the question, do we still sing her songs in light of the fact that she is uh, taking a stance on, a, on an issue that the Bible stands against? And, oh, uh, I don't remember exactly what we said, but I remember coming to the, to a conclusion that um, we shouldn't read her present theological convictions into her past work. Or was that the Gunger one? That might have been both. Um, probably both. Yeah, it probably was both. Is that um, I don't think we're justified in reading present theological convictions into, into the prior works. It would be like reading uh, Brett, you know, your, the author the author across from me, uh, reading a person's, an author's present beliefs uh, about something into works that he wrote several years ago when those beliefs weren't there. Like, you can't, you can't do that. Yeah, viewpoints do definitely evolve. Like, perfect example, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein has two different versions because Mary Shelley's views on the world changed and she changed a previous work to sort of show her current views. Hmm, I didn't know that. I didn't know there were two versions of it. I thought there was just Frankenstein. I mean, it's mainly in the ending. I can't remember exactly what the changes were, but they're definitely 
were changes because of her viewpoints. Yeah, and then there's also, uh, we talked about the one Vicky Bushi song that uh, everybody knows, uh, Glory to God Forever, and how um, <laughs> even though, like, that's the song that, like, her songwriting credits are, like, the most prolific, that um, it's not a Vicky Bushi song, it's a Fee song, which... Uh, Everybody knows Glory to God Forever. I mean, that song has uh, definitely been one of the most successful songs of the past 10 years. Uh, and Hillsong songs, there are some churches that uh, all they sing are Hillsong songs. Really? Well, I use that as an exaggeration, but it seems like their their main source of songs is Hillsong music. I mean, we had bands like that out of the camp that we worked at yeah. where, they, where it seemed like half their set was nothing just but Hillsong songs. Um, some of them were older, some of them newer. Uh, you know, Mighty to Save... From the Inside Out, The Stand. Um, what's that one song from them that I can't stand because of the chorus? Um, Second Summer. Second Summer. I don't remember. Forever Rain. Oh, yeah. Uh, Forever Rain, which I can't stand that song. Uh, I can't stand that song. Um, it goes into Jesus is My Boyfriend territory. Yeah, it starts off you know, pretty good, and then the chorus is... I'm running into your arms. I'm running into your arms. And I'm like, really? I'm like, come on. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. I'm like, really? Like, this doesn't logically flow with the stuff you're saying in the verses. But, again, with, uh, with as it was with Vicky Beeching, you know, having to answer the question, do we still sing her songs? This is a little bit harder to answer with Hillsong because of how prolific they are. With, uh, with Beeching, like, it was a little bit easier because we're like, well, you know, She's not really all that known, but this is Hillsong. This is like the biggest church enterprise in the world. Yeah, but I mean, I think the answer is still the same, though. I mean, if the particular song is true, if it's theologically solid, if it's, you know, a good song, period, then why not? But I'm going to be devil's advocate here for a second and say, okay, well, what if because churches do sing, do sing Hillsong songs, and keep in mind I'm playing devil's advocate here, uh, the, uh, these songs, and the, these songs, even though they themselves might be older songs, because of the fact it's associated with Hillsong, uh, still associated with Hillsong, that it might uh, convince believers who are on the fence on this subject who take a position on the same-sex marriage debate that is similar to Hillsong's. I know that, that still seems like a non-issue to me. A non-issue how? Like, I don't expl explain. I mean, like, the work alone is what should be viewed. Okay. I mean, you shouldn't view the artist. Now, if the artist gives an interpretation of the song saying, well, everyone thinks it's about this, but really it's about this, then that's a different story. But if the songs themselves, you know, reflect this certain view and that certain view is true, regardless of where it comes from. I mean, it's still a good song and it's still a song that should be sung. Okay. So you're getting, you're, you're getting to what I was next going to get into that, uh, the genetic fallacy, uh, Brett, would you like to explain what the genetic fallacy is? Simply put, the genetic fallacy is sort of, it's wrong because they said it basically, it completely, um, gets rid of you, says that's wrong. Because it comes from a certain source. Yeah, so, like, I mean, the best example of that is, like, you know, when talking about politics, you're like, oh, it came from MSNBC, so what's wrong? Or, you know, oh, that article came from Fox News, so it's wrong. So it's dismissing the merits of the song based on the source and not the the statements themselves. Yeah. So, I, and I would agree, and I, and I, you know, I play devil advocates there, but I agree with you that uh, we can't, we got to make sure that we're not totally writing off writing off the stuff just because it's Hillsong. But at the same time, I do think that um, pastors and worship leaders ought to be um, very, very careful if this, uh, depending on how this issue goes. I mean, this, this story was just reported yesterday. We don't know what the story, more of the story is going to turn, you know, what events are going to follow down the road. Um, personally, I think that pastors who, uh, uh, pastors and worship leaders ought to be really careful about, uh, I don't know, I guess like how much of a presence Hillsong has in their song selection and uh, how much of a tacit endorsement of Hillsong is present because um, depending on how, I guess, you focus, how you bring Hillsong into, uh, into the discussion, you might unintentionally be communicating that you agree with them on things that you don't. Well, because like Gungor, like think about Gungor, for example. I mean, 
anytime I talk about Gungor, and I talk about Gungor in the positive light all the time because I'm still a fan of Gungor, I gotta make sure that I'm, you know, taking pretty careful to state that, you know, I don't agree with them theologically, like, at all, um, because I don't want them to think like, oh, well, he likes Gungor, therefore he likes for what he likes parts about Gungor about what Gungor believes when I don't. I mean, at the same time, I mean, both of us listen to bands that are comprised of people who aren't that morally or theologically correct. Like I, for one, I really like Ozzy Osbourne's music, but I don't agree with him on hardly anything at all. <laughs> hardly anything at all. That's a great example. But that's the way you and I work. But we both know full well that anytime we say like, okay, let's take like Ozzy Osbourne. Like if you were to say at the camp that we worked at, uh, depending on how certain, you know, certain campers or whatever, that you were a fan of Ozzy Osbourne, you know that they would take that to an extreme that you didn't mean it to take. True. So, of course, I'm also the guy that has played an Ozzy Osbourne song in the kitchen before. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we played all sorts of songs in the kitchen that we yep. shouldn't have played. Um, we may or may not have played an entire Opeth album in the kitchen once. No, we may or may not have played two entire Opeth <laughs> songs in the kitchen at one point. Or um, albums, not. Um, yeah, yeah, we songs, play, yeah. Uh, Watershed, and I think the other one was uh, Damnation. Yeah, we tried to play Damnation and nobody was getting into it. I was like, man, it's Damnation. It's such a great, mellow album, but never mind. Uh, that's a, quite the tangent. Um, so that's why, like, for like a situations like that, because not to, like, make us out into people that we're not, but, I mean, we try to approach the subject of music in a way that, uh, and, and worship, in a way that reflects um, real careful thinking, in a way that reflects, you know, critical thinking. At the present moment, when it comes to critical thinking and music among among you know Christian circles, that's not uh, that's not as strong as it ought to be, and so uh, I'm not necessarily thinking that people are going to be like, oh well, Hillsong said it, I believe it, therefore it must be true. But in light of the fact that I don't think people necessarily know how to diver- how to uh, differentiate certain aspects of a musician or of a band that uh, they might unintentionally be influenced by this and I could be wrong and I hope I am wrong but um but no that's that's my fear is that uh, people will be influenced by Hillsong stances and statements on this matter and not turn their brains on and I guess evaluate what they're saying well I mean I definitely could see that happening too which yeah. is a shame yeah which is unfortunate because I guess this leads into my next question um in light of all we said so far, do we avoid any and all Hillsong-related materials? I'm going to argue no. Like, I'm going to say that no, we don't have to avoid all the Hillsong-related material because that would be an example of the genetic fallacy. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's true, then yeah. Yeah, and then in, but in two, we ought to still be really careful about how we avoid, or about how we go about handling Hillsong-related materials. I think that if, if, and I mean, I want to stress the fact that this is a fresh off the press story. The band hasn't publicly commented on this. We're exploring the what if of this story and where it could possibly go with the band. We're not saying that really any of this has happened. We're just laying out the what if. Um, I think this could be a really good chance to maybe um, get people thinking about, okay, do I have to like a band and agree with them? Or can I like a band and disagree with them? Can I listen to a Christian band like Hillsong and say that they're wrong on a subject? but still think they make good music. Um, I think that this would be a good chance to raise questions and uh, show how when it comes to music, uh, it's a little bit, it's a lot more complicated than we make it out to be in terms of like, oh, well, I like, who do I like? Um, Mastodon, um, that I like Mastodon, um, but I do not approve of the fact that the dudes are weed heads, like, and total pervs. Uh, so just if I were to say that to someone who knows who Mastodon is and I don't qualify my statement, you know, they're just going to be like, oh, he likes Mastodon. He likes everything about Mastodon. When I'm like, no, I don't like everything about Mastodon. I think this will be a good chance to bring that up. Um, and another reason why I think that we shouldn't avoid all the Hillsong related material, I mean, aside from the things we said, uh, let's take a look at a brief look at Mars Hill. I know people who will not touch the music of Citizens or the music of Ghost Ship because they are Mars Hill bands. And I think that's wrong, especially in the case of Citizens, um, because the they are so, or they were so opposed to uh, anything that had Mark Driscoll's name on it that um, at their own expense, 
they missed out on something really, really good. I mean, you listen to Citizens music, Citizens is pretty much nothing but straightforward scripture. I mean, they managed to take verses in Ephesians and write whole chorus and turn them into choruses, like straight scripture into choruses. Um, but because people were so caught up in the uh, in the fact that it's a Mars Hill band and it's a band from Mark Driscoll's church and they can't stand Mark Driscoll, that they're not even going to touch him at all. And so they're missing out on something great, which we could still have that happen with Hillsong. Yeah, but I don't think it'll be as extreme because so far this is the only controversial thing at least that I've heard from Hillsong, whereas Mark Driscoll has had oh, quite the history. O'Brien oh, O'Brien oh, Houston has mis- made several uh, controversial statements in the past. But, I mean, Mark Driscoll, though, I mean, uh, he's definitely, I think, been one of the most controversial figures in Christian era in Christianity ever. And, like, a lot of things he said have been just straight up immoral, straight up wrong, well, straight up unbiblical. The, the good news is, is that he has resigned from his church, so uh, that's, definitely. that's not the good news. Uh, I guess to close this out, because we're running a little bit later than I, than I wish, um, Brad, is there any music out there that's better to sing other than Hillsong songs anyway? Well, there's theocracy. Well, yes, but in the worship setting. Well, in the worship, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I'm totally okay with singing I Am in a worship setting, but um, or, or singing Mirror of Souls in a worship setting, but um, I don't know if that's very necessarily congregational. Well, I mean, we do have, you know, John Mark McMill, we do have Chris Tomlin, we do have, you know, the David Crowder Band... And we do have, you know, a bunch of others. We have Citizens. I mean, I mentioned Citizens. Uh, Citizens music is very congregational. It's very accessible, but uh, lyrically, it's very deep and it's very potent. Uh, We have uh, Sovereign Grace and Indelible Grace. Uh, They've got all tons of stuff. We have the Gettys. I mean, we have the the Gettys and the stuff they write. Uh, Really, like, honestly, my... If I were to not want to sing Hillsong songs, it's not really because, at, at the present moment, of what their church has said. It's because of the fact I really don't like Hillsong songs. <laughs> like, and, and I think that's a sufficient a reason enough for me. I'd have never really been the biggest Hillsong fan. Um, I haven't thought ill of them, but I've also thought that they're a little bit uh, overly popular when their stuff is uh, passable at best. They do have a couple of songs that you know I've been singing for ever in a day. Uh, if I never heard Mighty to Save or From the Inside Out again, uh, it would be still too soon. I think my lifetime quota on those two songs has been, like, like vastly achieved. Yeah, definitely. Same here. Uh, and so going forward from this, I mean, again, to emphasize that this is a brand new story, um, we need to um, be quick to listen and slow to speak on this and make sure that uh, we're accurately understanding what they're saying and making sure that we're listening to them. So that if we disagree with them, we know what it is we're disagreeing with them on and that we're not misrepresenting their positions. And we also, as always, anytime we're talking about something like this, um, the the Christian ethic and a Christ-like way of handling these matters trumps being right. Um, It doesn't matter how right you are. If you're a a jerk, um, no, you're doing it wrong. Uh, We are to uh, give a reason for the hope that for the reason for the things that we believe with gentleness and respect. Um, And that applies just as much in this instance and in, you know, really any other instance where a controversial subject is uh, is at the foray is that we don't, uh, we shine a Christ-like character in that we maintain our disagreements, but we treat the other person whom we disagree with in a way that brings glory to God because it reflects Jesus. So um, I think that's all we'll say on that. I don't know if we'll revisit this. I mean, if there's a significant development in this story, we might revisit the subject again. But if not, uh, then I don't think we'll talk about it again. Uh, So, Brett, um, you got any recommendations uh, for us this week? Actually, I really don't. I mean... What? Yeah, I haven't really encountered that much. You can't think of of anything that our listeners might want to go check out. Uh, The only thing I can really think of is recently downloaded... Robot Unicorn Attack 2, which if you play the original game online, I mean, it's kind of the same, but you can customize stuff. There's daily levels and stuff. I mean, it is fun, but yeah, that's pretty much the only thing I can think of. Okay. Um, I want to recommend a, uh, a, soft, a piece of software that I downloaded the other day called Rift Station. Um, I was uh, on YouTube looking for, uh, I was looking for a demo video for a uh, guitar pedal that I was thinking about buying, and uh, nobody ever pays attention to YouTube ads. But for whatever reason, this one caught my eye. 
and uh, it was called Rift Station. And I, I, st I stuck around long enough to see that uh, you can put in songs, like you can, like you can put in a song to it, and uh, it will detect the chords used in that song. And I was like, what? What? Because I'm like, uh, that is awesome. And then you can isolate, uh, if you got a guitar solo that's in one channel, um, you can pinpoint where that solo is, isolate it, and listen to just the solo. Like, you can tune out all the other audio and just listen to the guitar solo if you can, if you can pinpoint where it is and isolate it. So there is a, there's a 30-day free trial for it on their website. I used it a little bit the other day, and I experimented with it. I plugged in an Opeth song just to see what would happen. Um, and it actually, it wasn't perfect, but it was actually pretty dang, pretty dang close. Uh, it was Opeth's Harvest, which Harvest is uh, one of their more acoustic-driven songs off of Blackwater Park. And uh, it wasn't perfect, but it was definitely pretty dang close. And then I plugged in um, a couple of other songs and uh, was surprised at how uh, surprised at how accurate it was, even if it wasn't perfect. So uh, if that's something, if you're a musician out there and that interests you, I would definitely go check that out because, um, I mean, I would have loved to have had this stuff like starting out playing guitar, like I'm not ear trained, uh, very well. So, uh, listening to a song and figuring out what the chords are, unless it's something super obvious, like in the key of C or in the key of D, uh, I'm probably not going to figure it out. So this piece of software, once I use it a little bit more of it, if it's as good as it uh, has shown to be so far, uh, I'll be really excited to have it. Um, yeah, uh, that's it as far as Recos go this week. Um, Brett, thanks again for taking time out of your Saturday to, uh, to, uh, do this stupid, silly show with me. Um, no thanks for starting. I really like this. Oh, I do too. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, I want to thank, um, Rhapsody for, uh, for once again, providing us with the music for us to listen to so that we can review it. Um, I will say that I used Rhapsody the other night to, uh, in a, in a lip sync competition, um, I went back to uh, my former college, and uh, they asked me to be a judge in a lip sync competition, and I was like, uh, "Yeah, that sounds like fun." Um, and uh, I was able to uh, build the the songs that all the contestants were going to use within Rhapsody. They had, Rhapsody had every single song, and so uh, uh, it was a super useful tool. It saved a lot of uh, headaches in trying to get songs. People were just like, "I want this song," and I'm like, "Okay, Rhapsody has the song. We're good." So uh, Rhapsody ought to pay us for all the positive stuff that we give them yeah we should contact them and tell them like hey ask. we have mentioned you like almost every single episode in a positive light so how about we have a free subscription that'd be awesome yeah that would save, be. save me 15 bucks a month so yeah uh thank you thanks for rhapsody um and of course uh we always want to take time each episode to mention uh the gospel of jesus christ which ultimately is the reason why we uh, we care so much about the issue of music because uh, the gospel has saved us from a uh, from the kingdom of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of light and it hasn't transferred it hasn't just saved our souls um, it has saved the entirety of our lives and uh, all of its aspects are now under the light under the lordship of christ which includes music which includes uh our freedom to create our freedom to pursue uh excellence our freedom to uh approve of excellence and our uh our desire for what is good, what is true, what is noble, what is pure, and what is holy. And uh, the gospel redeems uh, the pursuit of music because we are doing it for, uh, as we now belong to Christ, our music now has um, a greater purpose and a greater uh, significance in our lives because it is it reflects the fact that we have been raised from deadness to life and we are making music in a way that reflects the creator God, even if it's a song about everyday life that... Our entire lives are under the lordship of Christ, and because we uh, we make music about all sorts of subjects, those things reflect the lordship of Christ in our lives. Even if it's not a worship song that mentions Jesus uh, four times in a verse, sixteen times in a uh, in a thing. I think that's just going to be like our be like our go to example is uh, believe me. Well, the thing is, it was incredibly true. <laughs> it was incredibly true. Uh, so. Uh, Yes, yeah, so uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is definitely uh, the main reason why we want to do this. And uh, sinful as Brett and I are, and as uh, as often as we are wrong and sometimes uh, not correct or uh, not as loving as we could be on some matters, um, that is our that's that's why we do this. Uh, so I am Austin, and I am Brett. I'll have to edit that part out because it took you like 
trillion seconds to get to the microphone. Um, but that's okay. I gotta go edit this now anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, check us out on Facebook and another Ascending Lark. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at AAL blog. Uh, you can send us an email at another ascending lark.com. You can rate and review the show in iTunes. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback and hear what you like, what you don't like, what we could do better, what we need to stop doing. Uh, especially if you think that Brett needs to stop mentioning My Little Pony, um, please write a review of that and mention that. And we'll be totally happy to take that as constructive criticism. Well, keep in mind, this episode, you were the first one to mention it. Yes, I know. Don't remind me. Don't, I'm don't. going to continuously remind you for always and ever. Dang it. Even when we are dead and we are in heaven, I will still remind you of that. <sighs> Dang it. I can't believe I said that. I still can't believe I said that. Um, you guys have a great week. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see y'all next week. <laughs>